Listen, uh, I I don't. The only astronaut I knew before you was, of course, Mae Jameson. Um, and we just uh, lost uh, Ahura uh, last week, and uh, who inspired a lot of people with uh, on Star Trek. Uh, and yes. so, so for you being an astronaut, it, what does that even mean today? Where have you gone? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's really interesting because, you know, there haven't been a lot of African-American female astronauts. Uh, you know, in fact, I became the fourth to go to space and I, I did it in a non-conventional non way. I am a commercial astronaut, so I, I'm not associated with NASA or any of the federal agencies. And so, okay, I was so you're like, so for, for people who watch For All Mankind, you're like Helios. <laughs> You're like going with the Helios people. You know, you got to go rogue every once in a while. <laughs> wow. So, so I was you, part of you... the first all civilian mission to orbit called Inspiration 4. And so last year on September 15th, four civilians went up in a SpaceX Dragon capsule and orbited the Earth for three days, all on our, our, our own. We did it. You know, we came together trained for six months and then blasted off. Okay, walk us through it. Now, SpaceX, that is um, Elon Musk's um, outlet. I'm not going to say anything about it because you're on the show, Dr. Proctor. So I'm not going to talk about Elon Musk, even though I'm very tempted. All right, I'm going to leave that over there. Karen, shut up. Okay, now walk us through, first of all, how, how you qualified because to be a commercial astronaut is, is wild. And then what kind of training did you have to go through and then describe the blast off? Well, you know, this was a really interesting and unique situation in that um, Jared Isaacman, um, he decided that he wanted to do the first all civilian mission to orbit. So he came up with Inspiration4. And instead of taking his buddies, who he easily could have just paid for and taken them to space, he decided to take three civilians, three strangers he didn't know. Um, and whenever he does any amazing endeavor, he ties a charity to it. So first off, he partnered with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and he told them that he wanted to, to, he wanted to do the largest fundraiser in St. Jude history. So it was a $200 million fundraiser. And he next said, I want to fly a childhood cancer survivor to space. And that's how my crew member Haley Arsenault got selected. And then he went even further and said, now I want to give away two seats to space. And, and so he ran a contest. He ran two contests. One was if you donated the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, your name got put into basically a hat and, you know, they drew out, uh, you know, picked a name and get congratulations, you get to go to space. And then the other one was, if you showed your entrepreneurial spirit as in, in some way and created a Twitter video. So winning your contest via Twitter, um, if you created a two minute and 20 second Twitter video and showed your entrepreneurial spirit, you know, basically saying why you, they should take you to space, um, you could win that seat. So that was the prosperity seat. And I won that with my original poem called Space to Inspire. Can you recite? Just one stanza. Sure. Dr. Dr. Paul. I'll, I'll, from my, my book of art and poetry called Space to Inspire. This is the poem that got me to space. And so I'll just read you the first part here. You've got space. I've got space. We all have space to inspire. That's why we dream of going higher and higher. But what is space if you can't breathe? Let's stop sucking out the air of our humanity. We have a moment to seize the light, earth from space, both day and night. We have J for justice to ignite the bold. We have E for equity to cut past the old. We have D for diversity to end the fight. We have I for inclusion to try to make it right. A Jedi space to rally behind, a universal force so big it binds inspiration to, to change the world, a new beginning for us to hold. I'll just continue. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about space to inspire for all of humanity, science, technology, engineering, and math, sending us out on the explorer's path. 
but don't forget the arts, the heartbeat of time. Consider sending a poet who knows how to rhyme. So let us drop the mic and close that capsule door, but please make sure Dr. Proctor's on board. My space to inspire is what we need. Inspiration for, for all of humanity. Yes, Ms. Applause, come on, <laughs> stingy. Oh, wow. So okay. that won me my seat to space. <laughs> now, being a poet <laughs> was one thing, but you're also a scientist. I am. So I'm a it, geoscientist. What does that mean? That means I love our planet Earth. And, you know, when we solve for space, we solve for Earth. What does that mean? <laughs> So, you know, a lot of times people are like, why are we going off and, you know, doing spending all this money in space exploration, moon, Mars and beyond? Well, it's ultimately to solve for issues right here on our planet Earth. Space is all about efficiency and food, water, energy, shelter, waste, all the things that we have problems with here on Earth. And so as we develop you know, new technologies to make us efficient and able to actually survive and thrive in the harshness of space and on the moon and Mars. All of that technology and, uh, and knowledge is created here and it helps us become more sustainable overall. But as you're talking, I'm thinking this planet, we got to see during the pandemic, during the early part of the pandemic, during those two months when we all had to sit down, that the planet started healing. Yeah. Waterways came back, air cleared up when the commercial airlines weren't going through polluting and others, the cars weren't polluting. The birds, the animals were like, oh, it's safe to come back out. The elephants, I mean, it in two months, we started to see a healing of our planet. So I don't know going to Mars or any place else is going to change the lack of humanity and the lack of uh, uh, connection so many human beings have with the very thing that gives us life. I, yeah. I don't know if that's going to change. Well, you know, it's not about because we want that connection, right? And we want to keep that. And and it, we're not leaving uh, our planet behind. We're not leaving Earth to go to the moon and Mars. Um, but we uh, humans are explorers and we like pushing the envelope. But what's great about it is as we do, you know, again, it's the, the technology and the efficiency that we learn along the way. And there's so many spinoffs. Uh, you know, we take for granted the fact that we, we carry basically a cell phone around with us. Well, this works all because of space technology. And, and, uh, and we, we love this, you know, we get more, we have more anxiety over losing our phone than anything else. Um, and, and we wouldn't have that if it wasn't for the technology that's being created through the advancement of human space flight. And, uh, I'm, hmm? and I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't go. I'm saying that the problems that need to be fixed aren't going to be solved with going because, the problems that need to be fixed have to do with people not polluting, not putting plastics out, not, not you know, emitting, you know, horrible, you know, fumes, not killing trees, mm -hmm. not killing. And, you know, it's like we no, kill each other, right. you know, like it's, <laughs> there's a heart problem that we have that's not connected to any sp space exploration. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. But that isn't that the Star Trek generation that we want, you know, Lieutenant Uhura, all of us getting along, you know, a united Federation. And so, um, you know, becoming one crew, uh, Starship Earth. And so, again, you think about those things about polluting uh, waterways and plastic and all these things. These are things that, you know, again, when it comes to being efficient, um, it, space can help solve for those things. But yes, you know, one of the big things about going to space in a very small capsule with other people is crew cohesion, how to get along. <laughs> How do we become friends? And the International Space Station is an excellent example of that. You know, with all the things that happening, um, you know, around the world, in particular, and particularly with Russia, you know, you have Russian crew members up there with U.S. crew members and everybody getting along and saying, hey, you know, we're an example. We can work through these issues and become better and strive for that, what I call Jedi space, just equitable, diverse and inclusive space for mm -hmm. all of humanity. All right. So walk us through your, 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 your training for that four minute ride 
into space and what what did you see while you were up there? Yeah. And so it's it's a short ride, but we stayed up there for three days. So we orbited the Earth for three days and um, we trained for six months. A lot of it was in, in Hawthorne at the SpaceX headquarters doing simulations. But we also did training for crew cohesion, centrifuge training. Um, we took a zero G flight. Um, a lot of medical training so that when we went up in space, we could do perform a lot of the medical um, research that we wanted to do. And so it was an intense six months. And as me becoming the mission pilot, that meant that, you know, I spent a lot of time with my commander, Jared Isaacman, going through simulations and potential contingencies and emergencies that could happen on orbit. 866-801-8255. Dr. Cian. Cian, uh, Leo Proctor. Uh, Leo is not your name and you're not a Leo. I That's correct. <laughs> so why do they call you Leo? So when we did fighter jet training, so I got to fly in a MiG-29 and an Alpha jet and an L-39, um, you get your, you know, you get your call sign, you know, kind of like Maverick for Top Gun. So my call sign became Leo because my crew members consider me to be a modern day Renaissance woman or a modern day Leonardo da Vinci because I combine science and art together. All right. Um, do you watch For All Mankind? I do. I haven't gotten through all of it, though. I've gotten through the, the first, I believe, one and a half seasons so far. Okay, because you you actually applied to NASA. There was a uh, in the first season, you know, there's this moon uh, race. The Russians win in this in this particular alternate universe. Um, and there's a little girl whose father is trying to get from, I think, Mexico to America. Mm -hmm. She is enamored with space. Uh, she ends up making it to America. I'm not going to tell too much more of her story, but I think about your journey. Your father worked for NASA. You're you, right. Your father worked for NASA. That's you correct. wanted to be part of NASA and you, you made it to the finals. Didn't quite get there. What did that do to the trajectory of your career? You know, that's, it's really interesting because a lot of times, you know, we have a lot of zigs and zags in our lives and I was born on Guam because my dad was working at the NASA tracking station during the Apollo missions. And I was born eight and a half months after Neil Armstrong took those famous first steps. So I considered myself to be a moon celebration baby. And, uh, but then my parents left and my dad didn't work for, you know, uh, NASA or any of that anymore. And I, but I grew up with all of this amazing NASA memorabilia to my dad, including this Neil Armstrong autograph to him, thanking him for all the help that he did during the Apollo 11 mission. And, and I just, I wanted to be a pilot and, and an astronaut when I was a kid. Uh, but, you know, then I, those dreams slipped away as I got older and I became a geoscientist. I became Dr. Proctor. I was traveling and exploring the world when somebody said, hey, NASA's looking for astronauts, you should apply. And I was like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> and that childhood dream came back and I applied and I got down to the yes, no phone call out of thousands of applicants, um, but it was a no. And of course those childhood dreams get crushed and you gotta come, you gotta have resilience and grit and you gotta come back from that. So I pivoted and I became what's called an analog astronaut. And an analog astronaut is basically somebody who advances human spaceflight here on Earth, but they're not, you know, um, they haven't made it to space. And so I lived in moon and Mars simulations. And so I lived in a NASA funded Mars simulation for four months investigating food strategies for long duration space flight. Um, so those are kind of the things that I was doing, hoping that one day I would find an alternative way to get to space, um, not your traditional way through NASA. And, and uh, you know, during COVID, Inspiration4 comes along. And, and, and what's interesting is that I became an artist and a poet during COVID. In 2020 was the first time I did any art. And, um, and so when that Inspiration4 came along, I thought, wow, I found my authentic voice as an artist and a poet. So I'm going to apply to go to space in that capacity. And wow. sure enough, that was the golden ticket. <laughs> Willy Wonka, four four months in simulation. Are you 
in weightlessness? Are you like what, it's so on the big island of Hawaii? So it was in a dome, a bubble dome um, called High Seas. And uh, basically, you're living in a dome with five other individuals as if you're living on Mars. So if you go outside, you have to wear a spacesuit. And it's in a very remote volcanic area, no trees or anything like that. And you act like you're living on Mars for four months. Are you pooping in a bit like what? So right now, season, the season that we're in uh, for all mankind, they made it to Mars. Oh, I haven't gotten there yet. Got to catch yeah, up. Yeah, they made it to Mars. <laughs> and it was a three-man race. So the Russians, Helios, which is why you didn't know what Helios was, which is a private company that I think is fashioned after either Bezos or SpaceX. Um and funded, you know, by billionaires or what have you. So you have Helios and then you have NASA and they're all racing to get to be the first to get to Mars. Right. So I'm not going to give any more away, but you get to see, you know, how cramped the spaces are and how, you know, uncomfortable, you know, the food, how disgusting the food might be. So were you eating moon food or uh, Mars food? Describe that. Dr. Yes. Proctor. <laughs> so um, in the Mars simulation that I did to investigate food strategies, we were using freeze dried fruit, meat, vegetables. So freeze dried technology um, that, to creatively cook. So, you know, right now, a lot of the meals that they eat in space are just add water and heat. But if you're going to go to the moon, or even Mars, you know, you, and there's a lot of people who love creativity around cooking. There's a lot of crew cohesion that can happen around cooking. So NASA wants to know, like, what's your bang for your buck? If you can allow crew members to be able to engage in the art of cooking and the creativity of that, when you go away, because food and mood are very entwined. And, you know, anybody who likes the matrix knows the one guy just wanted to be, you know, plugged back into the matrix so he could enjoy a good steak. (laughs) You know, you don't want, you don't want hangry astronauts out there (laughs) on the way to Mars. So, which is interesting because when we went to space for three days um, last year, people are always like, well, what did you eat? Well, I had pizza and I had the best BLT. Um, yeah, so SpaceX, you know, they were like, you're going for three days, you know, we want you to be very happy with your food. What would you like to eat? And I immediately said pizza. And and I'm gluten free. So they made me a gluten free crust pizza what? with pepperoni and, and olives and some jalapenos to make it a little spicy. And so you had I, what one of them, one of them cauliflower uh, crusted pizzas. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. And, okay. And, and then a BLT and my BLT, they found gluten free bread that was it was fantastic. Um, so I can't complain about the food I ate in space. <laughs> 